Has this ever happened to you? Or this? Will this make your memoirs? At Shelter Insurance, we can't iron out all the glitches in modern life. But we can manage your auto, home, and life insurance just fine. Shelter Insurance. We're your shield. We're your shelter. Get the insurance coverage you need at the right price. Call Mark Manning today. Tad Hall from White River Area Agency on Aging joins us as he does each and every month, and we're at Eagle Mountain Assisted Living. Mr. Tad Hall, welcome back. How are you, hey, sir? I'm, I'm good. You know, a lot of people don't realize that uh, White, White River Area Agency, we do lots of things. We take care of seniors for sure, but one of our uh, facilities is Eagle Mountain Assisted Living, and uh, we're proud to be able to say this is part of our group and that we serve the seniors that come here and we're very proud to do that and we have a nice facility and uh, so it's uh, important to know that we have tours and people can come and we we have some openings and uh, thank goodness the COVID uh, we've starting to get more people in and so, <clears throat> so we just wanted to emphasize our program today about Eagle Mountain Assisted Living but also David and we talked about this before our uh, we come on air today is that we continue to search for people that want to work for us and that's aides that go into our homes that take care of our seniors and that's a big portion of what we do sure. and we call that in-home services and so we do a lot of that we have about 650 uh, aides out in our homes in our 10 counties and they go in there and they help people cook and we give baths and those kind of things like that but uh, we, we, we have a uh, need for age to come. Uh, it's a good thing about it. We, we pay a decent salary. And, and the other thing, people are flexible in our uh, work day. Right. They, especially during the school season time, they can leave their kids off of school, come and work, and then go pick their kids up uh, in the afternoon. So uh, we're hiring people. And so if they want to uh, contact us, they can contact us at an easy number. 870-612-3000, and that's our number for our cor corporate office, and uh, we can, uh, if you're out of the area, then we'll get you to the right place as far as the next number. So we're, we're interested in, in hiring more people, and we've got work to do. Well, Ted, and we talk about uh, these aides and these jobs that we have, and it's not like that uh, uh, you just come in and we just throw you to the wolves. We have a training program that absolutely. is second to none. Yeah, absolutely. Tracy Baxter is our lead uh, trainer, and uh, we put our folks through a training period. Uh, I mean, we teach people how to, how to shave and how to serve folks that are sick, how to transport them from the bed to the wheelchair, all those kind of things that are important for senior care. And uh, we, we've been around here over 45 years, and so uh, we're going to continue to do that business. But we, again, we just need the help uh, to do that. I want to mention something about Eagle Mountain Assisted Living and kind of tell the folks uh, uh, there is a, a difference between a, a nursing home facility yes. and an assisted living facility. Kind of go through that and tell right. us the difference. <clears throat> yes. For a person to, cut, to live in an assisted living, they have to be able to do certain functions. For right. example, Ha they have to be able to, uh, when they sleep, be able to get up and go to the restroom. Right. They pretty much feed themselves. So there's some criteria that that's based on that. And of course, this is a private pay facility, and uh, so it is important that you know when you come here that 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 that's part of the deal. But we have RNs, we have LPNs, we have people that can help with medications, three square meals a day. So it's a pretty good deal. And of course, we take. Uh, you know, uh, insurance, a long-term insurance, and so, uh, of course, we pay and all that kind of stuff. So we work with people, and they just, if they're interested, they just need to come. And uh, Sheila Gates and her staff here do a great job, and uh, we're really proud of the Eagle Mountain Assisted Living. 
Well, the phone number is 870-612-8700 yep. if you need some information on Eagle, Eagle Mountain, Mountain Assisted Living. And, and, and of course, uh, uh, again, going back to the age, we, we need age. We need some people who are interested in a career that uh, we're willing to train these people, uh, flexible on job, you know, the hours, as Mr. Ted said. So if you're looking for some gainful employment and with a heart for people and taking care of folks, that's what we do, Mr. Ted. Absolutely. And we appreciate you guys doing You know, the last uh, several programs we've done is about hiring folks. Sure. And so uh, it's an issue that we're dealing with, and that's what we're doing. We're going to try to take care of folks. and. Uh, uh, but we need the folks to do it. <laughs> He's Mr. Ted Hall, used to be Coach Hall, <laughs> Superintendent Hall, Schoolman Hall, and now the Executive Director of White River Area Agency on Aging. Thank you, Ted. Thank you, Dave. Another in a series of our interviews from the White River Health System in Batesville, and we're visiting with uh, Dr. Megan Smith to, uh, today, and welcome to the program, young lady. Thank you so much. I'm super excited to be here. Tell us a little bit about Megan Smith. Tell us a little bit about uh, some background. Tell us about your family and uh, uh, kind of share with us some educational experience and, and how, how you got to Batesville, Arkansas. Absolutely. So, um, my name is Megan Smith. Um, I work here at the Children's Clinic. I'm married to my husband, Will Smith. He works with Survival Flight, and that's actually how we ended up in Batesville. We have two children, Austin, he's six, and Bo is one. We're originally from a, a super small town in Mississippi. It's called So So, and it's really close to Laurel, Mississippi. If any of you have ever watched HGTV and seen the show Hometown, that's, that's right. my home. Yep. So, um, after graduating from high school, I went to medical school at the University of Mississippi Medical Center in Jackson, Mississippi. Um, and then I did two years of family medicine residency in Hattiesburg, Mississippi, before I decided to change to pediatrics. And I did my training at Arkansas Children's Hospital. We lived in the Little Rock area about three years. Um, and then we ended up here in Batesville uh, after my husband fell in love with the town. And then I fell in love with the town once we started working here. Well, let me, let me ask you this. I mean, I ask doctors this all the time, and it's interesting to me, and it's interesting to our viewers. Where along the way, Megan, did you did did did, did you have this? I mean, just thought and say, okay, that's that that makes me want to be a doctor. I mean, how did how did you decide, and when did you decide you wanted to become a doctor, and then why pediatrics? Right. So actually, I was probably honestly five years old when yeah. I knew that I wanted to be a physician. Um, you know, I was that little kid that was just fascinated. I remember my papa, um, he would take insulin shots. And here I was five years old, and I was just fascinated by watching him take insulin shots. And I would actually even help him um, as I got older, give the shots and check his blood sugar and things like that. And so that really sparked my interest, you know, in medicine. And then afterwards, when I got older, I kind of struggled with, you know, what field of medicine do I want to end up in? And it wasn't until I had my own children when I realized pediatrics was the place for me. Um, you know, I wanted someone that would take good care of my kids, and that's what I try to do for the, my patients. Um, I try to take good care of them just like they're my own. You know, every doctor that I've ever asked tells the same story, and it never gets old to oh. me about something along the way with their family when they were younger, just like your story, that uh, uh, you just got involved and you like that. And you have to be a caregiver. You're a caregiver, first of all. And then, right. you know, as a child or as a, a teenager and a young adult, and then all of a sudden you're a doctor and you're still a caregiver, <laughs> you're still giving care. Tell, tell us about the children's clinic. Tell us a little bit about what, you know, what that is and, and uh, who we treat and how we treat them. Absolutely. So the, I love the children's clinic. It's such a great place. Um, it's a great workplace. It's a great place to bring your kids um, when they're sick or even when they're well. So what we do here at the Children's Clinic is we take care of kids of all ages, you know, from birth to 18. Um, we're involved in the delivery of the baby, the transition from the hospital over to the clinic. We follow them through their wellness visits. We see them for sick visits. We monitor their growth. We monitor their development. Um, we provide immunizations based on, you know, the recommended CDC schedule. There's so many things we do here, but mostly we love to be involved in our, our families' lives and help them any way we can. So 
if we know that the community is in a time of need, the clinic will rally together and we do things like food drives, yep. um, supply drives to help different, you know, parts of the community out when, when they're in need. And I think that's really speaks a lot about who we are and what our mission is. And, you know, we're here to serve our patients and their families. Any limit on age of people that get to see you? Um, so I take patients from birth up to age 18. Okay. And so I specifically did extra training um, just to take care of kids. That is what qualifies me as a pediatrician. And so children are not just small adults. They have their own set of needs and their growth and their development is totally different than adults. Um, the diseases that they have is totally different than adults. And so after doing that training at Arkansas Children's, um, that's when I learned all the things about kids and how I need to take care of, care of kids and how I need to treat them. And so my training has really set me up to do well in taking care of the kids here in Batesville. That makes you a specialist in the field, obviously, and uh, with great training at the, at the, uh, down in Little Rock. Uh, just to kind of off the cuff a little bit, uh, what, does, uh, what does Megan and Will Smith and the family do in their, in their time when they're not med flighting or, or, or working as a, at being a doctor? What, what, what do you guys like to do? Yeah, so um, we kind of are, I guess, a, a medicine power couple, you know, with him doing the critical care flights and then me taking care of the kiddos. But in our spare time, um, we have a little hobby farm that we're starting at our house. And um, we have planted a great vineyard and okay. hopefully next year we'll have a little crop. Um, but we really enjoy you know, farming. We hope to have a few cows here by the end of the year. Um, my husband, he grew up on a huge dairy farm in Mississippi. And so it, it's really getting back to our roots, you know, and, you know, we want to teach our kids good values and, you know, how to work and how to solve problems and, you know, what it's like to grow up and be responsible and take care of things on the farm. Well, obviously, a White River Health System in Baseball, Arkansas, it's a big plus for both of them to have you guys, uh, you know, implanted in, transported in from Mississippi to Arkansas. And you said you've been here for some time and, you know, not in Baseball a long time, but been in the Little Rock area. And, you know, we welcome you. And kind of like if somebody needs to see you at the children's clinic, how do we do that? Absolutely. So you can give us a call. Um, our number is 870-260-2200. We are located at 1700 Harrison Street. It's Sweet Inn. It's right in front of the hospital. Um, and then you can visit our web website at whiteriverhealthsystem.com. Uh, you can also look at the White River Facebook page. And so please reach out to us if you need to make an appointment, have any questions about the services we provide. We'll be glad to answer any questions we can. Well, of course, what we do, my company, we serve the Newport area. We serve uh, uh, the Batesville area. And, uh, of course, we serve around the world with these Facebook interviews. And, and uh, uh, I, I certainly appreciate you taking time to join us on a day that we had a few technical difficulties up front. And, and uh, yes, anything that I said wrong during this interview, I'm going to edit, as I told you before we got on. That's mighty kind of you. And just to throw this out there, we see patients in all areas surrounding baseball. I have, you know, patients up in Mountain View, patients out to Newport, and just the whole surrounding area will be glad to see y'all. So just give us a call, schedule an appointment. I'm taking new patients right now. Some of the other providers are taking new patients right now, and we would love to take care of your children. It's such an honor to watch them grow up and see them change and develop over the months and years. She's Dr. Megan Smith at the Children's Clinic in Batesville, and she's a specialist in pediatrics from birth to 18. And if anybody out there needs her services, you've got the number and you can see the number on the, on the screen. And once again, thank you for taking time to join us. Thank you so much for having me. I've enjoyed it. wish uh, John Chadwell a happy good morning in one of the dog days of summer when it's hot out there. Business as usual at NEDC in downtown Newport. How's John Chadwell? Well, John Chadwell's doing well. Um, he's kind of glad he has a job that's not outside all the time right now because it is very, very warm. 
you know, it does this every June, every June, July, August. It always gets this way. I don't know why we get all excited about it, but <laughs> the heat has been a little bit more excessive than what it normally should be. And uh, uh, anyway, we'll get through it, my friend, won't we? We will. We will. And uh, I know it's hot and dry, but uh, that's that's good for the construction that's going on next door to our building on Tech Depot. They're pouring the foundation uh, today. So that's uh, that's pretty exciting. Wait, listen, that Tech Depot, I mean, it, again, like we even do at NEDC, a work in progress, but going to be an impressive facility. And uh, if you drive down there like I do, you know, weekly and just kind of look, and you watch the progress. Sometimes you think things aren't going on, but man, I'm gonna tell you what, where we are, they're working and they're getting it done. And a lot of things have to happen before you pour the foundation. Oh, that's right. You just don't see all the stuff that goes underneath it. And then we've got that project going on. We've got the outdoor Wi-Fi accessibility uh, part going on. So they're getting ready to uh, pour that. Uh, we've, we've, uh, there'll be a few picnic tables with trees in there, as well as parking spaces. And we just finalized a deal uh, with today's Power Incorporated uh, to put a ele electric vehicle charging station in there. So awesome. there's going to be a dual port uh, electric vehicle charging station in the outdoor Wi-Fi park. We're finalizing our deal with Ritter uh, Communications to provide the Wi-Fi for the park. Um, and then on the other side, we're finalizing the plans to bid for the parking lot where the old DHS building was. Mm -hmm. And so it's gonna be a really nice uh, entrance to downtown for people as they come in through Hazel. But more than that, Tech, Tech Depot is already going. You know, we're right. using the old uh, train depot right now. And uh, so this week it's been, it's been hopping. Uh, we've had uh, uh, camps, STEM camps for kids in there. So we've done a, a VEX robotics camp where the kids build robots designed to do different challenges. Uh, maybe the challenge is to move around. Maybe the challenge is to actually have arms and lift things off. But they're learning the coding that allows them to code the microcomputers on the robots uh, to do what they want them to do. And then simultaneously, we had a camp for 3D printing. Uh, and so we had a number of kids who came and they learned really computer-aided design. There's a, a, a program called Tinkercad, which is a, a smaller computer-aided design program, but it gets them in there learning how to use the computer to design pieces. And actually, they needed a small tool for the robots. And so the kids on the 3D printing side downloaded the plans, managed it with the instructor to print one of those tools that they gave to the other side to be able to use for what they needed for the robot. So it's, I mean, it's a pretty neat, practical, hands-on camp. And then the Joe and Helen Harris uh, Center for Opportunities. They've also had several camps going on. Uh, one was in cooperation with Tech Depot uh, in which they did an art camp that included digital graphic design. Uh, and so they were learning to do designs on an iPad uh, and directly on an iPad as is done in most design businesses today. Uh, so we've had a lot of STEM things going on. And then the Harris Foundation had a, a number of other camps too. They, they had regular art, uh, I think they're finishing a knitting camp today uh, to teach uh, young uh, young people how to knit, which is a, many people think that's an old school kind of uh, skill, but it's a skill that could that, that's very helpful in life, and it teaches you a lot of problem solving as well. And then uh, they had a baseball hitting camp and a softball hitting camp. So I think over the course of of this last week, over sixty young sixty different young people. Uh, from Jackson County or in some kind of enrichment camp and every single one of them was offered for free uh, through the things that we're doing so, so that's a it's a wonderful thing uh, for our kids and then Tech Depot is already uh, working with three different companies on training uh, and then we're working with some proprietary software providers and I think when we get our new facility up those proprietary software providers uh, are going to work with us to let us be the state or the state area where they do their training uh, in Arkansas. So it's some exciting things going on at Tech Depot. Well, I mean that's why we we have it and we we have it for you know uh, uh, you know participation and more kids are coming. If people wanted to participate in one of those camps or there's something else coming, how, how do they, how do they get to how do they get who do they call who do they talk to? 
So for the ones at Tech Depot, they just need to follow the Newport Economic Development Commission page. Okay. Um, and and they'll, the, the flyers will show up on our page. The ones at our building are a cooperation between ASU Newport and Tech Depot and the okay. NEDC. So those three groups, uh, we're, we're all working together to collaborate. I know the ones at the uh, Harris Center have been a collaboration between uh, the Harris Foundation, Tech Depot. They've got one that's going to be a collaboration between the Harris Foundation and um, the hospital on okay. healthy food prep. And then they've got one, they're going to do a Bex Robotics one out there. So either follow the NEDC page or the Joe and Helen Harris Foundation page. And if you go to the Joe and Helen Harris Foundation page, you can sign up for their camps as well. Uh, as, as I said, they've got a couple of more coming down the line. So uh, it'll be it'll be a good opportunity for your young person to, to learn some skills and to, to be able to have a little fun during the summer and not let all learning stop. There you go. Well, having fun and learning is kind of part of the process. I like that for sure. Cryptocurrency. What have you got on cryptocurrency? Well, we now have uh, three cryptocurrency mining operations that have uh, selected a, a home in, in Newport. One is announced, uh, GMI Computing. Uh, they're going to employ probably around eight to 10 people. Uh, right. Salary range will be 65 to 80,000. They'll also use a significant amount of electricity, which is really going to be a big boost uh, from a sales tax perspective to the city, county, and the NEDC budgets, college budget, the jail budget to pay off the jail. So uh, we're going to see uh, two of them will be located in the city limits. So the city will get a big boost out of that. The, the jail bond will get a big boost. College, NEDC, one will be located in the county just outside the city limit. So the county budget will get a boost out of that. So everybody's going to get a little a little money. Between all three of them, we'll probably have about uh, 25 to 30 new jobs coming in, uh, kind of computer tech operation and maintenance. One of the interesting things is that I believe all three uh, companies are going to use Tech Depot uh, as their training provider uh, for this. So they're going to find the people, hire them, and then Tech Depot is going to work with the companies to train people to be able to do operation and maintenance on uh, cryptocurrency miners. Um, and maybe even some folks who have a little more skill could be the site lead at each place. So uh, it, it's, a, it's a pretty exciting time. Uh, I know yes. cryptocurrency is kind of, everybody's watched it kind of go down, 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 down. Uh, I think it's going to go back up. Uh, but I mean, you know, I'm such an expert, but I do believe it'll go back up. <laughs> And, and as it does, I think these facilities will become uh, uh, very, very active uh, in our county. So uh, look, few, it'll provide a handful of jobs, like I said, probably 25 to 30 that pay real well. And then uh, it'll provide a lot of uh, resources to the county and the city. So we're pretty excited. The other two companies should announce soon. On Tuesday, June 28th, we're going to have a, a job fair, for lack of a better term, or an apprentice fair for uh, GMI Computing, one of the crypto companies. So at 11 o'clock on June 28th, they're going to do an overview of their company. You can come and listen, see if it's something you want to do. If it is, then they will interview you on the spot. If, if they decide you're who they want, then they'll offer you a job right there. Uh, and then the next week, we're going to start training at Tech Depot. So you'll already be paid while you're going through the training. Then the they're going to do the same thing at six o'clock in the evening. So you can do come at 11 o'clock in the morning, hear the overview, interview, come at six o'clock in the evening, hear the overview, interview. If, if you say, hey, I don't really need the overview. I know this is what I want to do. And you can come anytime in between 11 and seven and just sit down and get an interview uh, to work in the uh, tech part of the crypto uh, currency industry. They're also going to need some uh, janitorial help. They're also going to need security uh, for the facilities. And so um, the there, there are a number of different kinds of jobs that will be available through these. But we're pretty excited that these three companies will be uh, locating in, in Newport and Jackson County. Oh, where are those meetings going to be? They're going to be at Tech Depot be, or at NEDC building? They'll be at the NEDC building. They'll okay. be right here at our awesome. building and, and we'll host them here. That is awesome. Hey, it's great stuff, man. I just, I, I, I always look forward to talking to you uh, each and every month because we find out such, I mean, just very exciting information that's going on in our little old community. But before we end, I got to mention one thing. We have a flag in Newport, Arkansas. We have lots of flags in Newport, Arkansas, but we have the flag in Newport, Arkansas. Talk a little bit about the flag that we have. 
Well, we're, we're very excited that Greenway chose to build their new facility in Newport uh, and, and they've expanded. They're adding a few, uh, few more jobs at that facility as well. So we're seeing job growth. It's a wonderful welcome to Newport on the interstate and the flag just actually sets it off. Uh, you know, we talk, you and I talked before we got on the air when I was a kid and we would drive to my grandparents' house in Jackson, Tennessee, there was a huge flag. And I just remember that flag, even as a kid driving by, we would be almost halfway when we got there and we'd be so excited, but that flag was just kind of a landmark for us. And, uh, and this flag I think is gonna be a landmark for a lot of people and it'll help people. Where's the big flag? Well, it's at Newport. Hey, when you get to Newport. So um, I'm, I'm really thankful to Greenway uh, for what they have done in investing in our community. And I'm thankful that they put up that big flag that's a, that's a great welcome to, to Newport and then shows that we are very patriotic uh, here in Jackson County and that we still believe in America and what she stands for. It's an impressive sight coming, uh, if you're going south on 67 at two o'clock in the morning, like Linda and I were just a couple of nights ago to see that big, beautiful flag waving there. At the, and it was kind of a windy night at two o'clock in the morning, windy morning and the, uh, putting the lights and the, I mean, the sky was just lit up and that flag was blowing. And what tugs at you hard, I can promise you that if you're any, got any patriotism in you whatsoever. John Chadwell from NEDC, the executive director. I appreciate you, my friend. Thank you, have a good day. Customized vision care in Newport, and this guy is Dr. Gavin McDowell. You've seen him in the most recent commercial that we did a month or so ago. But <laughs> welcome, my friend, back to a new business spotlight. Yes, it's sir. always my pleasure. The last time I saw you, you looked just like you look today. What has happened since then? Nothing? Uh, nothing. I haven't aged. Um, I've had these braces forever, and I think I came out of the womb with them. And <laughs> Life goes on. <laughs> <laughs> But it, well, you did lose your father, and we, you yeah, know, we yeah. In, uh, I mean, just mention that just real quick, and I mean that, that's always tough to lose somebody. But eighty-two years old, and, and oh, uh, had yeah. a great life. It's not like, and I, <laughs> this is gonna sound really dark, but it, I, I'm, I've said this to many people before. Who, oh, I'm sorry about your dad. Well, he was eighty-two. It's not like a shoot didn't open. Uh, it, it was, he was eighty-two. <laughs> he was exactly not in right. great health, so it happened. That's exactly right. I, I, we're in the exam room, and boy, I know yes. people are intrigued about what goes on here. But yeah. and before we got started, I, I'd ask. Don't touch him, that. We, we, oh, no, please. please. <laughs> <laughs> it might go off. <laughs> I asked Doc, I said, I want to talk about some of the, maybe the strange or the different uh, uh, scenarios, not the people, not the personality of people, or sometimes that comes into play also, but right. some of the strange things that you've seen in your time as an optometrist. Oh. And, and of course, his first answer was, I know a guy, and man, he was talking about me. And he said, I was, <laughs> Other than moi, yes. talk about some of the strange things that you've seen. Just off the oh, top of your head, one or two things. The uh, patients who have multiple contacts in one eye. I can't really. <laughs> yes. Uh, they don't realize, and, and uh, as some people mature, okay. they lose some cognitive ability and they forget they've already got their contact lens in, so they put another one in. And it doesn't affect their vision to the point where they don't notice it, and they put another one in the next day. And so yeah, I've, I've pulled. I think my record's four. I've pulled out four contacts in one Serious? eye before. Yep, yep. That's Absolutely. pretty different. Isn't it? it is. It, it, it's kind of fun though. Whenever you, you have somebody who comes in with particular complaints, and you think to yourself, okay, it's going to be this or this or this or this, and then you get in under this this what's called the slit lamp. It's a microscope, and just get in there and look like. Oh, I was wrong. <laughs> <laughs> There's something else in there. But I, it, it's odd that most of my odd patients tend to be contact lens wearers because it's it's instances like that. Or uh, my eye hurts. Well, have you got a, have you worn your contacts in a while? No, I haven't worn contacts in years. And you look, and they got a contact. And they have contact on. in there. Yep, yep. Don't realize it. So. Maybe I need to look in my left eye again or get Linda to look in my eye. <laughs> is there any hope that that could be the case with me? No. No, it's no. not happening, is no. it? No, you are, you are a dumpster fire. That's right. That is right. Uh, 
train wreck is, I think, train the terminology. Wreck. You had a dumpster use. fire on a train. That's, that's right. exactly right. What is this machine? What does this thing do right here? I mean, we've been in here, and, 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 and we look through these things, and you go uh, four or five, six or right, seven. Right. What is all that? That that You're talking about the device over there. Yes, that's, this one. It's called a Ferropter, and it is. Yeah, let's swing it over here. Okay. So people can see the, the business end of it. Okay. Yeah, it's just uh, literally it contains... A, a, an amalgam of lenses all put together in different ways so that way I can spin to go to check for a far side and this near side and this astigmatism, how that axis lays out. Uh, can I improve their vision with different settings that tells me that maybe there's pathology in the eye at play that's affecting their vision. Okay. So yeah, that literally was almost a full year of education just to learn how to use that. Really? And, and it's to the point now, it's kind of like the stereo in your car. You, you get a new car and you got to learn how to work that thing and then eventually you're just driving and dialing, not even looking at it. I'm oftentimes, I'm dialing this and I'm working on a computer over here and, and trying to figure out what my next step is. I'm not even paying attention to half the things I'm doing there. So, But it, it looks impressive. It and does. It, it, and it, the look, I, oh, I got that. Was that a play on word? It looks. Yeah. It looks. Uh, it looks impressive. But it, and it's heavy enough to be a boat anchor. But it's. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I, that's usually where most kids are hanging from. Is that right? Whenever I come into the room. <laughs> look at me, Mom. Yeah. I, I, that, that machine right there probably is the most amazing thing in all my years of looking through something and it, I mean just how you turn it and it makes it it's blurry and that's not blurry and this yeah. is more clear is that is that more clear or less clear well it's less clear it's amazing how that thing works and the technology in that thing is probably quite old correct old, very old yeah yeah uh, it's German most optic stuff if it's good optics it's it's German so but it's it's all German uh, optical physics it figured out how to put all that together and been using it uh, since uh, the late 1700s. Really? Uh, a version of something like that. I knew it was old, but I was thinking like, like 40 years. <laughs> <laughs> no, it, it's older than that. Yeah, the, the, the professional optometry actually goes back to, to the early 16... Well, actually, well, they were creating lenses uh, back in the uh, 1400s. Are you serious? Yeah. Well, that's a pretty good history lesson yeah. when it comes to vision. When it comes to eye vision care, eye vision as care. we like to say yes. on this program. <laughs> yes. So business has been good. You guys have been booming. We, I, I see the cars. I see the traffic. Uh, uh, business has been good. I, I, yeah, the move over to this location has been a, a true blessing. Really been working out well for us. So. If you've not been with us and if you've not seen Dr. McDowell, we certainly ask you to get your next appointment when you need a, whether it's a, a health vision, a health examination, vision examination, either one of those. But if you just want to come by and just tour the facility, oh, I mean, it's state yeah. of the art. I mean, it's it, it set out. And I know you, you really studied a lot when you remodeled this building of how you wanted to get it in a, in a more of a streamline. Yeah. But I mean, this is it's pretty cool, right? It here. is. It's fun. It's really fun. And I'm coming up on the 27th of May yes. for my first tour through the through all through, the all, machines. through, through the, that's all the machines you've been through before. I just moved them. I uh, know, same <laughs> machine. <laughs> Now, this particular one wasn't using 1400, was it? This Not that one. Not that Not one. That one. That's in the room next door. Okay. <laughs> That's <laughs> what I have to start off. That's at the start off. But uh, tremendous staff. Yeah. Fun place to work. Talk about how fun it is to work here. Because it is fun. It is. Well, I'll put it this way. We were talking about this before we got on. That uh, I hire personality. Yeah. Uh, I, can, I can train... I can train most anybody to do most of the things that I need them to do for me before I see the patient. So... I want somebody who's not going to have starched underwear and who's going to be, you know, loose and, and people want to visit with because, let's be honest, you're probably going to talk to the staff more than you're going to talk to me. Right. But I want the staff to be an extension of, of what my personality is, well, what I think my personality is. Like. Right. But, uh, yeah, I mean, I try to find people who not only uh, uh, complement the, the personality and the attitude we have in the office, but also add to it. And so that's, yeah. I like I, I like working here. <laughs> Not my, boss, my boss is kind of cool. <laughs> Not even like a job, is it? <laughs> Not even like a job. Just come to work, do as you please. Well, do, some days it feels like a job. Does <laughs> it? <laughs> He's Dr. Gavin McDowell. We're at Customized Vision Care in Newport, Arkansas. And folks, I tell you, I've used this man for a long time, and he comes highly recommended from uh, uh, the Black family. And uh, if you need your eyes checked, for uh, health reasons, you need your eyes checked. For vision reasons, 
the eye health care right eye here at Custom Eye Vision Care is always yes, top sir. notch. Gavin McDowell, good to see you, good sir. Good to see you, too. Merchants and Planners Bank was founded in 1946 by farmers and business owners because they needed a community bank that knew them and understood their business. A lot has changed since then, but Merchants and Planners Bank is still employee-owned and operated, and we're still committed to knowing and understanding the needs of every customer we serve. Great rates, fast turnarounds, and experienced local bankers ready to work for you. That's why you should choose Merchants and Planners Bank. Stop at any of our 12 locations or contact us at mnpbank.com. Newport and maybe the uh, most uh, extraordinary interview that I've ever done because we're <laughs> at Dr. Hannah Hare White's office and we're going to visit with Amanda Reynolds while Amanda is receiving some injections. And first of all, Hannah and Amanda, welcome back. And Hannah, tell us a little bit about what we're going to do here today. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Amanda, for being here. Um, we're going to be doing Botox injections on Amanda. Um, so we're going to be treating these lines in her forehead. Okay. And what Botox does is it makes the muscle not move. So um, the idea is if the muscle doesn't move, then the skin doesn't wrinkle. So that's the idea behind Botox. Um, so we're going to be injecting the different muscles of the forehead so that it doesn't wrinkle. Awesome. So it, only here. <laughs> Would you see this? And I'm so glad that it's Amanda sitting in the chair and not me. <laughs> yeah. I know it doesn't hurt, but go ahead. Just, just let, okay. tell us so, what we're doing here. Right. So I'm going to, um, this right here. So scrunch right there, Amanda. So these right, muscles right here is called the glabella complex. So I'm going to kind of write on her and kind of get an idea of where I want to inject. So scrunch again. So there's three little spots here that we like to get to get these little, what we call leaven lines. And so we'll do that and then raise your eyebrows up. And then this frontalis muscle here, we're gonna get across the forehead and then raise your eyebrows up one more time. We're gonna treat this little brow here cause she's got a little brow wrinkle right there on both sides. And then squint for me. Crow's feet on each side. Do two little spots on each side there. And then on right there. So those are just kind of, it helps me get an idea of kind of where I want to inject and get an idea of how much she needs and that kind of thing. So. Well, and that's what we're going to do right yep. here on this interview. We're going to get our. Uh, uh, I would say the apparatus <laughs> out to use, and and then, uh, but it's very, very interesting. And you do this; you've been doing it a long time. And it's I've been, been doing this business. about three years. Yeah. Um. So, um, been pretty busy with it here in the town of Newport. So. Absolutely. And I've been treating Amanda for how long? The whole time. The whole time. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Awesome. Well, here we go. All right. Tell us what we're doing. So I usually like to um, pinch before I inject just to kind of helps with discomfort and that kind of thing. Okay. So I will pinch and then we will stick. And I'm going to give about 10 units there. And then go to the other side. And give 10 units there. And then right here in the middle, and give 10 units there. Perfect. And that's it for that spot. Very interesting. <laughs> then we'll move up here. And this is just alcohol, just to clean. We'll stick right here. And this was the crunch we were talking about earlier. 
She had mentioned a crunch. Amanda had mentioned sometimes you can feel a crunch going in there. And <laughs> it's just sounded the, sounded fine to me. The skin is so uh, you know tight that it can sometimes do that. And then we'll treat this spot right here. Yep. Mm -hmm. And then this crow's feet on this side. Looks good. And then the other side. Let me get some here. And raise your eyebrow up a little bit. There. And then on this side, on her card's feet. That's it. That's it? Yeah. Amanda didn't cry or anything. <laughs> and you didn't even flinch. <laughs> you didn't even flinch at no. all. <laughs> that is awesome. I'll get her. It's not bad. No. No. Get her cleaned up here real Clean quick. Clean her up here a little bit and we'll. Yep. Then we're good. So this will take two weeks for effectiveness to take place. Okay. Um, and then the muscle shouldn't be able to move. And so the idea would be that it doesn't wrinkle. And that'll last about three to five months. I was going to ask how yeah. long do you, but before you yeah. need another one. And then uh, and it's good to start young. Yes, right. yes. Good to start young so that down the road, you know, you don't have wrinkles. Isn't it something? Yeah. Isn't it something? That is amazing. I, I mean, yeah. it, to, to come in, in Newport, Arkansas, and you can have yeah. this done. And I know you have a lot of patients. If somebody is new and, and they're thinking about having these procedures done, what do they have to do? Who do they call? What, what do they do? Um, well, they can call and make an appointment. Call my office, 523-3289. Okay. Uh, three, three, okay. And I, we can do like a free consult where I give you an idea of how many units that we, you may need and how much it'll cost. And we can do it right then or you can come back and do it another day. It's up to you. Um, but I do do offer those as well. That is awesome. Tell me about the training that went into doing this. I mean, you had some training. Yes. So I had to go to Dallas to the National Laser Institute and yeah. learn how to do this. And then I also work under a collaborative physician who also does this, who kind of gives me tips and tricks and everything like that as well. So She's Dr. Hannah Hare White. This is Amanda Reynolds. I'm David Black, and I will not be the next one sitting <laughs> up there. But I might be, because as painless as it is, as painless as it, it, it seemed to be, and it, I guess that it was, that if, when mine goes up like that, looks like I might need a little myself. Thank you all so very much, Amanda. Awesome. We appreciate you coming in. And thank Hannah, you. thank you so much. Hello everyone and welcome to the Farmer Supply Association Agriculture Report. I'm Randy Klopetska, agronomist with Farmer Supply Association. Well, the, the story is quickly becoming heat and dry conditions. Uh, that's where we're at. We're taping on June 16th for this month's program and things have really changed weather-wise. As far as the dry part of the equation, uh, here on, in the western part of the Farmer Supply Association area, you know, Newport, Swift and Tuckerman up through that area, we really haven't had a rain since May the 26th. Now, now, if you get over in the eastern side of the area, you know, there's been, there's been last week, several people got a good rain. Some people got too much rain, actually, I think four inches in that area out east of uh, Fisher, but some areas got around an inch. So they're in a little better shape over there than uh, we are here on the west side, but the, you know, they're heading in that dry uh, situation real quickly, that direction real quickly. Temperature wise, everybody kind of hit the heat wave on the same day. Uh, Sunday, uh, this, this past Sunday is the day that uh, things really went from the 80s to the mid 90s real quick. So you know, we're, again, we're facing that double whammy of heat and dry conditions at the same time. So we're going to give an update on our crops and kind of talk a little bit uh, you know, about what's going on, plus how this heat and dry, how the heat and dry conditions are affecting our crop out there. 
want to start with wheat and you can see behind me a wheat field that was harvested over this past weekend so you know wheat harvest is, is going now it still hasn't got into full gear in some places but anyway a lot of wheat is being harvested this week it was too wet last week we had showers every day but this week you know we've gotten dry and uh, and wheat harvest is really going right now so uh, yields that i've heard so far and it's, it's really kind of early to get a true estimate but the yields i've heard so far have been mainly in the 70s uh, here's some reports that maybe some of this later wheat uh, maybe a little better than that too so you know it's not a bin busting crop but a good crop and hopefully those yields will kind of ease back up and we'll see a lot of 80s and maybe a little more than that you know with the uh, wet spring we had we even though the wheat looked good from the road we kind of expected maybe not to be a bumper crop just because of those wet conditions wheat wheat does not like a lot of wet weather i mean needs moisture but not a lot of wet weather so anyway as harvest goes on hopefully those yields will pick up a little more but uh, you know not a bad crop at all so uh, that's kind of where we're at with wheat I want to switch gears and change directions we've got a rice field over on this side and i want to talk about rice uh, this rice situation right now and how it's going um, the one good thing about uh, this uh, this dry period that we've had we've really had some good conditions as far as getting our urea out on dry ground and you know i talk about that about every year you know the most efficient way to get nitrogen fertilized on your rice is to get that urea out on white dry ground get a flood across it as soon as we can. And as you can see in this field right here, it just really looks awesome. And again, most of that, I think I've gotten two calls so far this year on uh, less than ideal conditions for putting uh, fertilizer urea out on dry ground. Both of those were from our wind store uh, over east of here. So, you know, that's uh, otherwise we've had great conditions for getting our fertilizer out on dry ground. So we look for tremendous efficiency from nitrogen from a rice crop. And that always sets us up for good yields. If you have a good stand, get that urea out on dry ground, get some good weather, we're set up for good yields in rice. So hopefully that'll happen. Hopefully these temperatures will moderate as we get into the reproductive stage of rice. And again, uh, you know, we'll be set up for a good crop. We're still ongoing with our urea applications. We've got later rice that's just now coming up. So you know, this will be going on for basically the rest of the month. You know, a little, little more small scale, but we'll still be fertilizing and flooding rice for a little while to come on some of this later rice. Grass control, and uh, that's where this hot and dry, these hot and dry conditions can affect us some. You know, I, I harp, and you've heard me many times harp about, uh, you know, the, the importance of overlapping residuals, getting those activated. Well, we did good until that you know dry period here, like I said, over here on the western side of the farmer supply area about May 26 is when we quit having any rains. So those earlier uh, residual applications got activated well. Hopefully you got an overlap activated as well too. And in those fields, I think we've got a lot of good grass control. As we get into these later uh, fields, we're not getting that rain so you know, probably got the first residual might be activated but right now we can't get a second residual activated because it's just been dry so unless you're flushing or something like that you can't get another residual activated so grass is starting to break through on those fields and you know it sounds easy like maybe well we can just put a post emergent application out there and take care of it but uh, we've talked about how iffy the post emerge herbicides are and they're a lot more iffy when you get in some extremely hot conditions, highs in the 90s, especially mid 90s and up, and these dry conditions. So it's really gonna be tough for these uh, post-emerge grass herbicides to work. I think we'll see a lot of failures on some of these later, later rice fields. So they, again, that just goes to show you how important it is to overlap residuals and get them activated if you can. As far as those uh, post-emerge grass herbicides, uh, the group one herbicides, which ones uh, we were talking about, maybe Rice Star and Clincher, uh, that family of uh, grass herbicides, they their activity really goes down here hill quickly when we get above 90 degrees in the daytime, and you know we're in the mid 90s plus right now. So, you know those herbicides are not going to work well generally, even if they've got moisture, they're probably still not going to work well just because of the heat effects on those uh, on those herbicides. Uh, the group two herbicides, the ALSs, something like a regiment, we might be able to get better activity out of a regiment. You know, anytime we don't have good growth or, or you know, of a weed or whatever, the control's gonna go downhill, but I would look for maybe something like a regiment to still have better weed control. 
Uh, they recommend, uh, the, of course, the triple place or factin is recommended with uh, regiment, and they recommend upping that rate to one and a half percent from one percent of the adjuvant triple play uh, or equivalent if you're uh, trying to spray some uh, barnyard grass on dry ground. Of course, we've also got the issue of resistance issues with ALS herbicides too, so you know, no guarantee there if they're resistant, it won't matter. But again, that might be where you want to turn to if you got barnyard grass and you're in these hot, dry conditions is something like a regiment. So again, the weed control, the grass control is just, just getting tough because of these conditions. Uh, Nitrogen-wise, um, just want to mention something we've talked about the past several years. The university has verified many years in their research. And then that's after we get that pre-flood nitrogen activated, we want to wait at least three weeks and to me preferably at least four weeks before we put that mid-season fertilizer out there. We need to give it time for that early nitrogen to get taken up by the plant. There's no point in putting that next nitrogen shot out there before that time or we may just lose it. So, you know, wait at least three weeks. Like I said, preferably four to five, I think, would be even better as long as your rice is not yellowing up. And then put that mid-season uh, shot out there. You want to be sure you're at green ring when you do that and don't do it any earlier than that. So again, remember that rule of thumb uh, when we're talking about that mid-season nitrogen application. Next, we're going to go across the berm here, and we're going to talk about corn and soybeans. Uh, so as you can see right here, uh, we don't have a corn field to look at, but I've got a corn plant in this soybean field. So while I talk about corn, David's going to pan in on that one volunteer corn plant out here. We've got a great location here. We've got all the crops except for one, but I, luckily I was able to find one corn plant out there that we can pan in on while we, uh, while we talk about corn. Of course, corn, uh, right now the big issue is, is getting to the point of irrigation. Uh, we're just now getting there in a lot of cases. We've had some, like I said, rains before, but we're quickly getting there if we're not already there. Uh, especially here on the west side, we're there. On the east side, they're getting there. So we've got to stay on top of our irrigation needs. You know, the corn is now starting to tassel. The earliest corn is tasseling now. We're going to be moving into pollination. And it's unforgiving at that point. The corn plant is unforgiving. Like some other crops, we might be able to you know, stand a little while without, uh, without some irrigation or rain. But with corn, once you get to that tasseling and then pollination stage, you've got to have adequate moisture. And it's really more than just soil moisture. You know, if when you water, that's going to cool that canopy down a little bit. And you're going to both get your moisture in the soil, but you're also going to be able to, uh, you know, maybe negate uh, some of that heat uh, because it's just cooler in the canopy when you got moist soil or water out there. So stay on top of your irrigation needs. It's very critical. Uh, nitrogen for corn uh, needs to be finished up really around that tasseling stage. Uh, that's, you know, hopefully you've got all, all you go, plan on putting out there by that point and get it activated and I think we'll be good on our nitrogen, so remember that. And if you're going to put a fungicide out on corn like a lot of people do nowadays, especially where they're pushing things, uh, get that out by that brown silk stage and I think you'll get the benefits of that. So uh, just remember those things. Irrigation by far number one, getting your nitrogen finished up getting a fungicide out there by the brown silk stage if we're going to use a fungicide. So that's where we're at with corn and we'll move away from that one corn plant now and we'll talk about soybeans as we've got a nice looking soybean field here and like every year with soybeans it's all across the board. You've got some fields like this. This field is actually blooming and uh, setting pods out there. Uh, nearing canopy closure on these rows and uh, you know on the other side of the coin we've got uh, uh, bean fields that are you know, the seeds still in the bag and uh, with the moisture conditions about gone in some places it may stay in the bag unless we get a rain pretty quick so again uh, soybean conditions all across the board and uh, so uh, again not a really a new story from year to year on that. I uh, want to talk a little bit about uh, irrigation on soybeans and one thing about soybeans they're a little bit more forgiving than, than corn especially and even uh, rice you know as well so uh, you don't have to worry about pushing them if, we, if we've got other things going on the wells committed to some other crop again beans are a little bit forgiving especially before the bloom stage you know I think I think they can take a little more than sometimes we think they can so but once we get to the bloom stage and setting pods like this one it becomes a different story we really really need to keep our water needs taken care of again before that uh, 
again, it's not, I mean, we need, they need moisture, obviously, don't get me wrong, but it's not near as, as critical maybe as with some other crops. They are a little more forgiving at that point. So again, irrigation is big. Uh, weed control, just like I talked with rice, uh, some of our herbicides we use in beans are gonna be affected greatly by these hot and dry conditions. Number one would probably be clethodum that we use for grass control in soybeans. It's in that same family, those group ones is rice star and clencher. So, you know, as we get in these hot temperatures, if we're still dry, clethodum's probably not gonna work as well for us. So uh, keep that in mind. On the other hand, on soybeans, some of our most commonly used herbicides probably can withstand the, the heat and drought and still work pretty effectively uh, when you use them. So we've got that going for us. You know, specifically something like Liberty, which is, you know, used in Liberty beans or Extend Flex beans or, uh, you know, Inless beans. I mean, any of those situations we can, we can use the Liberty and that actually likes the sunshine, the pretty hot temperatures. So we've got that going for us. You know, even the Enlist, the 2,4-D, you know, it's more, certainly going to be more tolerant of these conditions than something like a, you know, group one grass herbicide. So we've got some things going for us on weed control, so take care of that. You don't have a lot of excuses on taking care of that. But again, try to do that before it gets just extremely, extremely dry and, you know, in, in those situations. That's take, take care of our weeds while they're small and get that done. So that's kind of where we're at with soybeans and with, that, with our major crops. I want to uh, finish up by talking about what I call uh, joining crop management. You might say, what are you talking about here? And I'm talking about when you're plant, planting crops in the spring, let's try to avoid getting these crops right next to each other, or just you know, adjoining each other across the turn row from each other. When, uh, when there can be problems with uh, herbicides from one of those crops, getting on, uh, the, herb getting on the other crop nearby, and, uh, and causing problems. So uh, we got to really keep that in mind. I had actually one of our farmers, uh, one of our farmer members, you know, said, uh, he said, wanted me to talk about this, or he mentioned that. He said, man, I'd, I'll go on your show and talk about it myself, is what he told me. I said, well, I'll take care of it. So, you know, I know everybody's got the right to plant what they want to, and sometimes you don't know your neighbor, you can't plan with him, and sometimes things just work out that way. But if there's situations where you can avoid those problems where we have adjoining crops next to each other, that are sensitive to herbicides from the other crop, you know, let's try to avoid those where we practically can. I know sometimes you can't, sometimes you definitely can't control what your neighbor does, but in situations where we can work together or plan out our own, you know, crop situation, let's try to avoid those real sensitive situations. I guess with rice, number one would be our, uh, you know, our conventional rice against our uh, full page and clear field rice against our, you know, Max Ace and Provisia rice. Let's try not to get those things just, you know, right next to each other because it's going to be hard to ever get the field sprayed because, you know, there's such a good chance you're going to get it on the other, uh, other varieties and, and cause damage. In soybeans, I think one of the big things is uh, next to rice fields, if we can get some uh, STS beans out there, maybe to kind of negate those effects of the permit because permit is applied on so many acres of our rice that if we can you know, get some STS beans uh, near those rice fields that are gonna be sprayed with permit, uh, that'll help on some of those herbicide issues right there. So again, you know, there's no law about it and uh, you can do what you want to. You know, we're free to do what we want to on that, but if, if you can work with your neighbor or plan on your own farm, you know, ways to avoid some of those issues you know, with adjoining crops and herbicides, you know, try to keep that in mind over the off season. Maybe we can get, get a little better than that and avoid some of these situations because it's really tough to get a lot of fields sprayed because of these situations. I know, I, you know, I or other consultants, we can recommend things and sometimes they can never get put out or they have to be delayed so much because we just can't spray because of that adjoining crop issue. So anyway, that's where we're at right now. Uh, we'll be back with you in July and hopefully things have cooled down just a little bit, not too cool, but maybe back down at the low, low to mid nineties at the worst and maybe some lows down around 70 or something like that get some timely rains and get this thing uh, going in, in the right direction. Uh, until next time, this has been Randy Kopechka with your Farmers Supply Association Agri Report. Well, it's the first community bank in Newport uh, school report, the Greyhound report with the head Greyhound, 
John Bradley, Superintendent yes, Newport Special or Newport School District, I guess is what we're called now. Welcome, my friend. How are you, sir? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. Well, it just kind of reminds me that we talk about the Newport Special School District. We've had a change of names, and just yes, talk sir. a little bit about that before we get into the nuts and bolts of what we we're going to talk about. Yes, sir. Um, we we are now officially the Newport School District. Good. Uh, that's kind of been in the works for a, a year or two, and okay. uh, just became official. So it's, it, we'll we'll have a little branding change here before too long, and. Um, that's kind of what we'll be from now on. John, you are excited. You've talked about uh, this being your hometown. You're talking about uh, uh, you want, always wanted to come home. You did. You coached. You became the principal. And now the head head person, the, the uh, superintendent of schools. What's going on over there? First of all, how, how have you last several months on the job been? I know it's been hectic because you principal and superintendent at the same time is kind of a, a, a tough job. But uh, Yeah, it's been a little bit of a whirlwind. Um, we, uh, it's been pretty hectic. You know, trying to do a, a the, trying to finish out the year as the principal and make sure graduation was taken care of and and just kind of closing out the school year and then uh, really, you know, those last two months I spent doing a lot of the superintendent stuff right um, with um, uh, trying to hire personnel and and move things around and, and kind of get trained on some things. So it's it's been very hectic, but uh, but it's gone well and uh, you know I became official uh, June first. Right. Took over. Mr. Bunch moved on on uh, the end of May to Brooklyn, and so uh, kind of been in place since then. And things things have been going well. It's just very fast paced right now. Well, I know that Mr. Bunch was a, a big help to you yes. as as, as, you, as you we transitioned into that, and he stayed and kind of helped you, and we thank him for that. But uh, what's going on at the school? Where are we? We're looking forward to a school year, and everybody says, "Well, we just got out of school. Why are you?" Talk? Well, we did, but we're already preparing for the for this coming year. We're hiring folks. Tell what's going on there. Oh yeah, we we've had uh we're we're pretty well getting close to being done personnel wise. Um, hopefully, we'll have that done by the first part of July. Uh, summer's the busiest time for a school, really. Yes, it is. Uh, trying to get you know our maintenance crew and our custodial crew. They're working extremely hard, getting all our floors taken care of, and we're moving teachers around, moving things from one campus to the other uh, where it's needed. We've got a lot of teachers doing in service right now. Um, we've got one that our, one of our teachers is actually putting on an in service for the state next week, and we're hosting. It'll be a chance for us to show our facilities off a little bit, and um, it's just a lot of lot of things going on in the summer. We've got teams practicing. Uh, going to camps, uh, it's, it's just that school officially ends at the end of May, but it keeps going through the summer. It's just <laughs> something constant. John, uh, once you have a principal that moves to the superintendent's job, then you have a you've got a chain reaction of things that happen that have to happen, and they have. Talk yes. a little bit about some of the personnel from an administrative standpoint. Yeah, we have been very, very fortunate um, to, to get the people that, that we've been able to, to hire on and, and come back. And when I say come back, I mean a lot of people that have been, that are from here. Right. Um, you know, when I moved over, we knew that uh, you know, we had to have a high school principal. And then, of course, Brandon Gates went back to Tuckerman, right. kind of the sure. same thing. Um, so we needed an assistant principal, and we were very fortunate to get Richard Greer uh, back as principal. He's been at Augusta for 12 years, and then Kenyon Miller. Another graduate of Newport that's back as the assistant principal, and and then they're going to do an unbelievable job at the high school. Richard's already, you know, he started Monday. I was telling you beforehand that uh, I was so glad to get him Monday because it's taken some of that off me because I was still trying to do double duty uh, with even summer school um, as the principal part, and so uh, that's been. We were very fortunate with that. Um, uh, Candace Long has moved into our high school counselor role. Okay. Um, Amanda Brogdon, who actually taught here for a year, is back as the assistant superintendent. Um, we've had a couple of changes in the in the central office. With uh, uh, we got D Dr. Nancy Churchwell as our new financial officer, okay. um, and then uh, we, just some other personnel moves, kind of within the district. But uh, Tiffany Brogdon has moved to the elementary principal. Um, with Misty Bergen moving to assistant principal, Julie Reardon is our new dean of students at the elementary. Um, Amy Thaxton and Grover Welch are both doing uh, curriculum with Amy's kind of over curriculum. Okay. Grover's kind of assisting with that, but he's also over adult education, which is something that we're starting uh, this this fall. Uh, I think everybody's pretty well excited about about what's coming up here. At the, the school year is going to start. Uh, I guess we start in August, and uh, the football's going on, and I guess they're practicing basketball, volleyball. Lots oh, of yeah. things happening right now. It's a busy summer for the kids. Very, very busy. And, and like I said, we've got stuff going on all the time. And uh, you know, we've got we've already been to both basketball teams have been to one or two camps. We got another one leaving next week, and uh, football's going to team camp. They're practicing pretty much four days a week right now. Uh, volleyball's doing the same thing. We've got cheer at camps right now. Um, so it's, I mean, it's constant. We got a driver's ed class going on. I mean, you name it, there's something going on and um, with, along with summer school on both campuses. And when elementary's getting ready to start their big summer reading program, July the 5th, I think. And so 
Um, we've, we've got a lot of things. It's a very, very busy time. And, you know, we're talking about personnel. I do want to mention that we have a, a, a meet and greet um, June the 23rd. Okay. It's next Thursday. Okay. Um, from 5 to 7 in the high school cafeteria for all our new employees. Okay. Um, community's welcome to come. Uh, we, we, we've hired several people, so we just kind of want to do it all at one time. There you go. There you go. Well, congratulations on your new uh, job assignment. Uh, I think you're going to be fantastic for the Newport uh, School District and obviously for Newport, Arkansas. And uh, I'm looking forward to the year. And more importantly, I appreciate your friendship as yes, always. Sir. That's yes, John sir. Bradley. He is the head Greyhound. And the Newport Greyhound Report brought to you by First Community Bank here in Newport. And we appreciate them for doing so. Thank you, sir. Yes, sir.